the USS Kincaid DD-965. It was a Spruance class destroyer. The gr things I remember most about that ship was gas turbine engines versus old diesel engines. Because I was then became, had become an engineman. So that was exciting, you know, because uh, that's a whole different kind of power plant, a whole different kind of sensations and, you know, um, that was one ship where you tied yourself into your bunks, you know, with your belts and your shoes and your clothes on the outboard side of your, under your mattress so that it went like this, so it made a U shape between the bulkhead and the outside of the, and you could sleep and go back and forth all night and not fall out of your bed. And um, the weaponry, like the ASRACs and um, having a helicopter on board and, you know, getting opportunities to get in helicopters and go out on maneuvers and things, you know, because they have to have a certain amount of time to come on, you know, landings and things like that. So they always take crew members with them just, you know, for joy rides. That was all cool stuff. and. That's when I got to go on a Westpac cruise, and uh, at the time, I think it was probably late 78 or 79, we were in Australia, and an American warship hadn't been there in a number of years, and we were like the first ones in. That was pretty awesome because, you know, it's, when you go into a foreign country, you're a foreigner, you know, and you don't know really what to do, but when you go in under those circumstances, it's like you're a national hero or something, you know, and everybody wants to meet you, everybody wants to take you out on the town, everybody wants to do this, everybody, and it's, it's kind of overwhelming, and you say, well, all because of this, I'm getting treated, you know, like this, you know, and it's, it was, um, it was cool, it was, it was a lot of fun, and uh, I got to go to a lot of places, I've been to Fiji, the Philippines, New Zealand, Australia, Korea, you know, how, how many people get an opportunity to do that and not have to pay for it, you know? And uh, it was just like a regular job, you know, except you didn't get to go home because your home was only like 150 feet down the, <laughs> down the way, you know? But yeah, it, and it, it, I already knew the whole concept of the team effort and, you know, the camaraderie and things like that. And it just reinforced it. It was nice to go back to it after being in the civilian world for a little while. Um, and I really use that kind of thought process now today in my work, trying to get people to work as a team of things that I learned in the Navy on how, you know, you weren't given a choice, boom, boom. So you learn how to do it, and then it just becomes second nature because you do it all the time. And I think this is what we need more of today. And that's what I try to do in my workplace. Um, the, the ship, uh, the experiences, it was just all good times, you know. For, luckily for me, it was all during peacetime. Um, I was just a um, E3 engineman. I was in a uh, damage control party. Naturally, everybody gets that job. And, uh, and a firefighting team. And basically, my job was, you know, we did maintenance and with the gas turbines, it was a whole lot different than the diesels because you had two in the front, two in the back, and you had like two auxiliaries. And they weren't on online all the time, and you take one offline, and there's really no maintenance to it. You know, it's in its own box, it's, you know, and you go over to the oil strainer, and, you know, it gets down to a certain temperature, you take the oil strainer out, you clean it, you put it back in. You check the oil level, and you check the lights on the console, you know, green, 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 you know, and if something goes wrong, you just call the first class or the chief, and they call, and they come over and they pull a computer chip card out, and they put another one in, and I mean, that was really all there was to that job, where on the other ship, you had to make sure the oilers were filled, and you had to, you know, look for fuel pressure, and you had to look at RPM, you had to, you know, where it was all on gauges and it was all things you had to do mechanically versus this one where it was all automated and they just called down and said, we'll put number two on mine and you just go over and you push a button and damn thing starts and get the green lights and say, okay, switch control and then they have their engine, you know? So, 
it was a lot different. It was kind of nice because there wasn't a whole lot to do, but it was neat to learn what it all was. You know, and if I'd have stayed in and went into like a gas turbine rating and gone to school to learn how to, you know, do things like that, we did have to take some auxiliary ones off in the Philippines, which was interesting because instead of cutting a hole in the side of the ship, they decided to run these rails through all the passageways, and we did it all with chains and pulleys and. You know, went through this thing and changed the beams and went this way and, you know, finally got this thing up out and then they'd take it off with the crane and they'd bring us down and we had to take it all the way back down on the ship again. You know, so that was kind of, you know, that neat kind of backbone stuff that, you know, take you all day to do it, but, you know, we got that thing out of there and back in. Do you believe that? Oh, yeah, it was block and tackles and steel rails. It, you know, that's, I'm a mechanical kind of person. I work for a body collision service, so I'm mechanically motivated anyway, so that kind of stuff really, you know, like, oh man, I don't want to do that to me, that's going to suck, oh man, i got to see how we do this, you know, that was my thought process, I just want to see how it's done. <laughs> we were doing a, a uh, exercise with New Zealand and Australia and something like that, and one of the things that the Spruance class destroyer had was a bubbler system around the ship, which is supposed to emit little air bubbles so that sonar, you know, when it hits it, it's not hitting solid surfaces, it's hitting the air bubbles and doesn't send, at least that's what I was told that it's supposed to do. And uh, I don't know, well, one day we're standing back there on the fan tail and we're doing maneuvers and the next thing you know, here comes this submarine popped up right next to our ship and fired a fire and, well, we were done. That was it, you know, whether it was, you know, I don't know if it was a Russian or a Zeno or one of the people in the exercises, you know. Yeah, I guess something didn't work right because they got right up by us. And it was, you know, I wasn't expecting anything like that. So we're standing back there and up comes this submarine go, whoa, what's, you know, you're out there in the middle of nowhere. You can't see land nothing. And this thing just starts coming up out of the water unexpectedly. So that was, that was different. That was, and watching flight maneuvers off of the aircraft carriers. We were um, part of the escort for, I forget the name of the uh, aircraft carrier, but uh, yeah, watching their you know, takeoffs and landings and saw some aviation's bosun's mates, I guess they were, get blown off the deck and uh, got to watch our executive officer take a swim on the high line, transferring between ships while we are charging fuel. He went over on the bosun's chair and both ships went this way and the line went down and he was, came right back up, went aboard, never missed a beat, you know. Um, had the fueling lines come off during refueling and hundreds of gallons of fuel all over the place. That was exciting, you know, I mean, the first class petty officer trying to put the ring back on and uh, got to become a golden shellback, you know, go through all the embarrassing rituals. And it was amazing because, it, you know, I had heard these stories before. And, you know, I always thought that, well, that was really cool. Well, when we went on Westpac, I didn't realize what was going to happen. And then they told us about crossing the equator and the dateline, and we're going to do the golden shellback and the polywogs, you know, and I'm like, oh, wow, that is so cool, man. I said, wait till I tell my dad, because then I'll get one of them certificates, and me and Davy Jones are personal friends, and no matter what happens in the waters, you know, something's going to save me, you know, and just the whole tradition and, you know, legends and everything else like that, I just thought it was a great thing, and it was amazing that how many people said, well, I'm not going to do that. Well, why not? Oh, it's too degrading. Well, this is a great tradition. I mean, it's not sanctioned by the Navy. Okay, it's up to the discretion of the captain if he wants to do it or not. And, um, but there was actually people who didn't want to do it because they thought it was degrading. I'm thinking, man, you guys are missing out on such a cool thing. I mean, because they can't really hurt you, you know. And I've probably crawled through more garbage than they put in that chute anyway during my lifetime. I've eaten more dirt than they gave me. So, you know, I just thought it was a great tradition. And the Navy has great traditions of, 